Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, a weekly show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a program that centers on the world of the Beatles and what's going on news-wise with them. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner and many Examiner columns, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, Hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to talk about the ever-busy Paul McCartney. Uh, We're recording this show on September the 25th, and in the last few days, Paul has been involved with a couple of important performances, one of which was the iHeart Radio Music Festival in Las Vegas, and that was uh, on Saturday the 21st. And then a couple days ago, he was on Jimmy Kimmel Live. And so I thought we'd talk about those two performances, those two concerts, or I should say mini concerts from Paul and the band with Steve. So first of all, let's talk about the iHeart Radio Music Festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one... I was a little surprised that was the short, uh, the, they, they not only, number one, they opened that day, but they also played a relatively short set. I mean, they only played... Uh, eight songs. Eight songs, yeah. I mean, that's almost unheard of for uh, Paul. Um, but the big news there, though, is that they premiered live three songs from the new album. Right. Um, Save Us, Everybody Out There, and New. Mm-hmm. And, and I got to say, and, ha- and I'm kind of getting a hit here on the Hollywood B- Boulevard thing, too, but I have to say that uh, I'm going to wait on the studio versions before I make my final judgments. Um, Because new uh, new sounds great in a studio version. It really does. You don't like it live? I didn't like it as much live, no. I really thought new sound, it sounds, obviously it sounds more polished, but it just sounds like a better song in the studio version. Uh, Save Us has the potential to sound, to be a really great song. But again, it sounded kind of, it sounded not completely like they were still working on it <laughs> in the in the iHeart, uh, in the Hollywood Bowl version. You mean the uh, performance? Hollywood Bowl version. You mean the performance of it the they're per- working on? The performance of it, yeah, yeah. It really didn't sound that together. And everybody out there, lyrically, it, I just really didn't make it for me. I really didn't like it. Um, so again, I'm hoping that the studio versions are better because I really didn't think they measured up to given that what the studio version of new was I really didn't think the the other songs were up to their potential live yeah well you don't know what it's going to sound like in the studio till you actually hear it no no and, and that's true but I'm saying given how much better new was in the studio version I mean I love New, new. Well, again, you haven't heard the studio versions of those two other songs. No, I know that, but I'm saying... So you can't say better if you haven't heard the other two songs in the studio. No, but I'm saying new new studio version is better than the live versions, much better, which is kind of odd because, you know, in, in a lot of cases, the live versions are better. But in this case, um, new sounds great in the studio, and I'm hoping that Save Us and everybody out there sound better also, although I think everybody out there, given what it is, may not. But that's, I'm just kind of blustering along. I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of guessing. Well, for everyone that uh, didn't get a chance to see this or hear it, the eight songs, I thought we should uh, just tell everybody the set list, they were in this order, Magical Mystery Tour, Save Us, Let Me Roll It, Everybody Out There, Another Day, New, Lady Madonna, and closing with Live and Let Die. Right. Now, I had a chance to actually watch this on screen, and I was thoroughly impressed. I really thought that the band sounded amazing, and I thought that they sounded extremely tight, and maybe it was the way that it was mixed and everything. Um, I still have to wait, like you, with the two other songs, Save Us and Everybody Out There, to know what I think about them as songs. In general, I love when Paul rocks. I mean, with a live performance, rockers really work well, especially which, Paul's rockers. Which is rockers. one reason why Save Us has, has a lot of potential. Yeah. So it's, a good, it's a good rocker. The everybody out there, the way he 
you know, tried to involve the audience. It, it just the song. If the song is going to be good, it's going to be good on its own. It's not going to need audience participation. And um, well, it, so, it's it's tough to get everybody to sing along when this is the first time they're hearing it. No, that's <laughs> true. And and even to say everybody out there, everybody out there, you know. Uh huh. You know, it's hard, but I don't know. But what did you think of the song selection overall, apart from the new songs? The song selection, I thought there weren't enough. I, I wish he had. I wish, I wish he had done a few more songs. Um, he brought out uh, again. I'm getting ahead of the, the pack here, but he pro- brought out Day Tripper for Hollywood Boulevard. That would have been fun. I don't know why his set was so so short for a guy of his stature. It should have been longer, but. Well, you know what's really interesting about this set list is the fact that it just seems like when he does a shorter set list, mm-hmm. there aren't as many Beatles songs in there. And in this particular case, you got Magical Mystery Tour and you got Lady Madonna. It's kind of like when he did the 12, 12, 12 show. Mm-hmm. It was, a, you know, I, I forget exactly how many songs he did, but there weren't a lot of Beatles songs in there. A lot of solo, and he did My Valentine at the time. So the main purpose of him doing this show was really to showcase the new songs. And, in fact, on the actual set, you saw the new logo, the same logo that you have on the album cover. It's also on the bass drum right. uh, head of, uh, of Abel Boreal's drum set. And so, it really, this, this appearance from Paul had a special purpose, as does the Jimmy Kimmel show. But right. I think that the eight songs really sounded fantastic, much better, in my personal opinion, than the performance with Jimmy Kimmel. Maybe it's because he only really? did eight songs and his voice sounded better. Especially, I, I really have a strong affection for Another Day. Mm-hmm. It's always been one of my favorite McCartney songs, especially McCartney singles. It, it's a perfect single from Paul. You know, his first single in his solo career, and I'm sure that he ties that in with Linda as well. It's a, it's a song he probably associates with Linda. And it just so happens these past few days would have been her... Uh, 72nd birthday but his his voice sounded fantastic on another day uh, that particular performance I like the way that new sounds as a live song I have to disagree with you probably I love the production on the single in the studio but the only thing that, that I'm missing when I hear new live is that they don't do the ending the acapella ending which right. to me I really love on the studio version I think that's a very cool ending yeah I, I like that too and you're right that uh, that is definitely missing on the live version. It almost kind of reminds me of when Paul uh, did Only Mama Knows, which I always love the studio recording of, and it ends with those strings, and it ends clean on the record, and then they just, as a live performance, they faded it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why they did it that way. But, um, no, I, I think New still sounds like a really good song, and Save Us certainly sounds great live to me. As songs, as compositions... I need to hear the studio versions and get the full taste of the studio recordings of uh, of those two songs. But um, no, I, I really liked this particular uh, song selection overall. Mm-hmm. And uh, Magical Mystery Tour sounded great. And again, I don't know if it's if it's the mix necessarily. I heard more harmonies in this mix, so you really got a taste of the band vocals with Magical Mystery Tour and also with a song like like a song like new so overall i was very very impressed with the performance you never quite know how long his set that's going to be when he did the the um outside lands outside lands Mm -hmm. wasn't that a full concert yes okay there you go (laughs) that shocked me that he would do a full concert you know I i would picture maybe half a concert you know you're treating someone to a full two and a half hour show at a festival with all these other artists performing Right. So that, I thought, was really very generous of Paul. But uh, for something like this, it doesn't bother me that, that it was eight songs. And this way, there was more of a focus on the new songs. Because well, if, if you're playing a lot of Beatles stuff, you're going to get kind of washed away in the Beatles. And, and you may not focus as much or remember as much of the new material. There was talk before, before iHeart that he was going to play new songs and he was doing it. For the industry, there was a, it was kind of an industry showcase, which is not surprising, given what iHeart is and mm. has become. So, right. But 
yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good, I, I still wonder why he opened the show on Saturday and why he, you know, was not given a little more room to, to play with. It just did not seem like a good deal to me, but. I don't uh, we don't know, and those are the I kind of things we're show. probably never going to know, no. behind-the-scenes stuff. No. But I think what's actually very important to bring up is the fact that he's doing these festivals. Right. Uh, not just this one, but um, like I just said, The Outside, Outside Lands, Lands yeah. uh, mm-hmm. Bonnaroo, which wasn't that long ago. And I think it's really important for someone like him, I think if you want to remain important. He'll always be important because of his iconic status. There's no doubt about that in his his whole history, Beatles and Solo. But if he wants to remain relevant or if he wants his records to ever sell substantially, to really impress, he's got to be able to perform to audiences who normally wouldn't go to see him anyway. Right. Or who wouldn't be buying his solo records or his new releases. Right. And And, I I heard from a a lot of people who went to either Outside Lands or, uh, well, not really iHeart, but I mean, I heard from a lot of people who went to Outside Lands and who were, you know, who were very, you know, pleased by that and the the whole thing. On the other hand, there were people who didn't want to bother with Outside Lands because of, you know, they didn't want to deal with the crowds, they didn't want to deal with the hassles of getting in there, which that particular uh, festival was in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And so there were, you know, there was that sentiment too. But, uh, you know, if you if you want to go see Paul, obviously you go see him. Well, my point is that I think that it really matters to Paul that he still matters to the public mm-hmm. and isn't just some figure of the past and that uh, he was a Beatle and, you know, he'll always be cherished as a Beatle. And for some of his work as a solo artist, I think he still wants to have a big hit record again. Right. And the mere fact that he's been doing these festivals is proof positive of that to me. And I think it's very smart. Right. I really do. Because one thing that I really think I should stress here, it's very important, is that radio has changed so much since the heyday when Paul's solo records did really well on the charts. Which is not to say that they haven't in recent years. Mm-hmm. Almost every McCartney album makes the top ten in America on the Billboard charts. But they usually plummet. <laughs> right after that, and that's because of the trend that most veteran artists, when they release a new album, all the loyal fans go out and buy it, say, within the first month of its release, and then that's it. And the only way that these records are ever going to have any staying power is if radio plays the music. Or right. if there, there has to be other vehicles for the music to reach other people other than that loyal hardcore following and with Paul we're talking about the Beatle fans the fans that grew up on him with wings the new fans he's picked up along the way but if he ever wants to still continue to put out records where they have strong showings and there's a lot of interest in him he's got to be able to find new fans Mm -hmm. and there are so many out there that basically know him for having been a Beatle and for some of uh, some of the solo hits that he's had and so many of them have never heard most of his solo music, many of them still to this day haven't seen him live. And this is a great way for these people, whether they're young or even older. There's a lot of people who are older who still never saw Paul McCartney live, Mm -hmm. believe it or not. It's great exposure for him. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who have never seen him live who go to see him now, whether it's at a festival or, just by chance, they want to go and see him when he tours, and they're blown away. And they'll say, I can't believe I never saw Paul before live. I'll see him again. Well, he, and, he touched on that in the Kimmel interview when, when Kimmel asked him about people crying. And Paul even acknowledged that sometimes it's hard for him when he sees people crying. He, met, he talked about, uh, he said there was one guy at one, of, at one of the shows that was sitting there with tears running down his face. And he said, Paul, Paul said he looked at the guy and it, it was hard for him you know, to not start breaking up. And it's, if, you know, there's no question it's a very emotional experience, absolutely. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm talking more about the performance itself and that it's a very special thing and that people are, are very impressed when they see him live. I mean, oh, every sure. review I've read of his tour has been nothing but glowing and positive. Right. And not for anything, he's been like this... <laughs> 
his whole career. I mean, it's it's almost like all the people who have written these articles have never seen Paul live. This this latest tour, the Out There tour, is great. I wouldn't say it's better than Back in the U.S. tour, or you know, all, all the tours in the last ten years with this band. They've all been wonderful. I'd say they all they've all been equally great, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm just saying that it's very important to get a new audience or to to somehow find new fans whether they're teenagers, whether they're people in their 40s and 50s that have never seen Paul live or really haven't bought his solo music. And this is a great vehicle because what I was saying before about radio is you can't count on radio to play his music, his new releases. There's only certain formats of radio that will play a new Paul McCartney record, at least in America. There's a format called AAA, which is playing him now. It's basically, that format is a lot of the new bands of today that still have some of the traits of the music we grew up with. Strong melodies, strong harmonies, a lot of acoustic-oriented stuff. Mm-hmm. I used to call it the Dave Matthews Channel, <laughs> you know, years ago when he was, you know, the hottest thing in music at the time. But Paul gets some airplay on that format. Thankfully, when Kisses on the Bottom came out, he was played on what's called adult standards stations that play a lot of the standards, uh, you know, of yesteryear. Right. And... and uh, you know, it was great that there was a format of radio, a new format that was playing something new from Paul McCartney. But Paul has no control over what radio stations play. But he does have control over one thing. He has control over what he does in concert and also where he plays, whether it's his own tour or whether he wants to do these festivals. And it's really important that he do things like this because, like I said, it's exposure to people that normally wouldn't go to see him live or buy his solo albums. Right. So I'm very happy about the fact that he's doing these festivals. You did uh, see the note I put up the other day that um, New is number one on the classic rock and classic hits charts and 19 on the AAA and adult contemporary charts. Wow, so he's actually getting some airplay on classic rock. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, classic rock is another example of when you have a veteran artist like Paul McCartney, if anything, they'll play him for a couple of weeks when the new album comes out, and then that's it. It's more like out of respect. And then they don't really play his new material. That's the trend that's been going on, not just with Paul, but with every you know, veteran artist that's been around a long time. Mm-hmm. David Bowie put out his, uh, a new album, his first new album in 10 years. It got some airplay when it first came out. That's it. <laughs> You know, and the classic rock stations will play the old Bowie. <laughs> and I was actually surprised at that because, although I, what I, I, to be honest, I didn't hear the whole album, but what I heard was seemed to be pretty good. And for it to get ignored so quickly was kind of a shock. Uh, but I guess, you know, older artists have come to expect that. I know, I've heard Paul talk about that before. And Ringo, Ringo, of course, jokes about it. When he talk, when he asks people at the shows, you know, all six people who bought my album, so you know <laughs> yeah, they're but, aware um, of that. I, I definitely think that, you know, since you can't rely on radio stations, and, and I'm very happy that he's getting this airplay. I'm just talking about the trend that has been apparent for a long time now mm-hmm. in, in the United States with radio being what it is. It almost doesn't even matter what the quality of the music is. Sometimes it just the fact that he's Paul McCartney. He is this figure of the past, you know, he's now in his 70s. Are you going to play music, new music, from someone in that age bracket for your audience? Are they really going to care about new music from him? I would hope to think that program directors would say yes. Mm-hmm. Just like I think I would hope they would say that about David Bowie or any of the, the artists who are in their 60s and 70s. But, right. um, you know, that's why I really, you know, admire Paul for going this route. Let's jump ahead and talk about the Jimmy Kimmel Live show, what you thought about it. He, he did an interview with Jimmy, and then he also did a concert in which he did 15 songs. Well, they only heard two songs on the show. I know. That was a big disappointment for me. <laughs> well, given uh, I'm not completely surprised there because given the commercials and all the comedy route. I mean, Paul also was in a comedy routine there. Oh, so. <laughs> for two um, seconds. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, there was a lot more to the show than... And and there was another guest on the show, so which actually was, that was a disappointment. Why Kimmel had another guest on the show that night? I know that was very strange. Uh, but I I actually I really liked the Kimmel show. I wish they had used 
more of McCartney and why they didn't, I have no idea. I mean, that would just seem to be something you would you would have done, and you would have also cleared the decks, even expanded the show, you know, for another half hour to to use all that, and right. you didn't. And in, on, on top of that, and I did not see last night's show, he did the same thing last night with Justin Timberlake. Hmm. And that, uh, I have not seen the stream for the Justin Timberlake thing. I'm curious to see how that went as opposed to how the McCartney thing went. But, yeah, I, I mean, I loved the, the Kimmel show for a couple of reasons. Having been in that area, uh, I was there in uh, 2009 when Paul played the Hollywood Bowl. We went down that area, and Jimmy Kimmel mentioned it as right uh, down the street from the Hollywood Bowl. It's about a, a couple miles. You could actually walk there, which we did from that area to the Hollywood Bowl. And so, you know, it's a it's it's a downtown area. It's right across where they played, and you couldn't see it on television, is right across the street from what used to be known as Grauman's Chinese Theater. It's now called TCL Chinese Theater. Hmm. So that's there. The Hard Rock Cafe, where Ringo has appear, has done uh, been there on at least two occasions. One, I was there for one of them when he... Um, did a uh, a why hunger benefit um, thing, and uh, he's been there for for a couple things. Is right there, so all and all that is right in that area. And so, I mean, it's a very compact area. There's always movie premieres and things going on on that street. That I mean, there's the the stars, but the Kinks uh, sing about Hollywood Boulevard, and you can see all the stars on Hollywood Boulevard. All right. That's all right there because the Walk of Fame is right there. The Walk of Fame office is right there. Uh, there's just, uh, I mean, it's just right in the center of Hollywood, and for them to do that right there was just absolutely astounding to mm. take over Hollywood that way. I really thought it was great that they did that in that area. I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed that performance. I think a little more than the iHeart, only because of where it was. That's a, just a personal thing of where it was. Uh -huh. um, I uh, I thought the, the song the song selection was great. I was a little disappointed though that of the songs he did not do that he did at iHeart and he did not do on Hollywood Boulevard. You know, you almost have to laugh as they did not do "Live and Let Die." Hmm. You wonder why. <laughs> Obviously, the fire department would have been all over them for that one, but, yeah. and they couldn't have, but still, that would have been really interesting if they had done that there. Obviously, it, you know, it was, you know, that's a crazy thought, but still, it was it's kind of fun to, to think of them doing that there, but yeah. he did not. So Well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I was very disappointed with the, D with the TV broadcast mm. for the same reasons that you brought up, but... Um, the fact that Paul should have been the only guest on the show, right. and they really shouldn't have had all Jimmy Kimmel shtick, <laughs> you know, in, in the program. And it reminded me of a few years ago when Paul was on Jay Leno, and he was the only guest on Jay Leno. Mm -hmm. And the first half hour is all Jay Leno shtick. <laughs> yeah. And you don't need that. You've got Paul McCartney there. He should have been interviewed and performance uh, just nothing but that for the entire show i mean you could do the monologue i can i can understand that but the rest of the show should have just been paul and well i have to give kimmel credit the interview was great his interview was not the typical detached tv host who doesn't know a thing about the subject kimmel did and to get paul he even got paul to talk about carnival of light which absolutely had my mouth on the floor. Hmm. I could not believe that Paul actually talked about that. Kimmel asked the fan question, you know, is there more stuff that we need to, that we haven't heard? And, I mean, that was just, that was wonderful. That was fantastic. That well, was something. Paul gave the usual answer. I, what was the exact wording that it probably shouldn't be heard or, or there isn't that much interest in? And right. there was actually a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a boo in the audience. Like, you know, people want more Beatles stuff to come out there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think still in his mind, he thinks that what was put out with the Beatles anthology was the best of all the unreleased stuff. Oh, now, don't, you know, don't take that answer as being anywhere serious. What he gave was the formula answer. 
he knows very well what people want to hear. And look at the fact they're putting out BBC Two. They know that there's a market out there, and I have no doubt at some point that there will be more stuff somewhere down the line. Maybe not, I don't know, maybe, you know, some of us are getting a little old and maybe not within all of our lifetimes, but it will ha- it will happen. They know, I, they I hope know. you're right, and I think you are right, but, you know, I want to know the backstory behind BBC Two and why it's really coming out and mm-hmm. whether or not it's really meant to be a companion piece for the book from Kevin Howlett or was this something that's been in the works for a long time? Well, because hopefully if, we will get to find, you and I will get to find that out eventually. Yeah. And we'll be able to have the answer to those questions. But in general, though, the whole thing of the unreleased thing, you know, I, I, I mean, you know as well as I do, there are formula answers that Ringo and Paul give to any kind of, you know, any kind of those questions. And that was Paul's formula answer that, it's the same thing Ringo's been saying for years that everything has come out that's going to come out or that was worth coming out. And he, and, but the fact that he mentioned Carnival of Light again sounds to me like he has my, said that he would like for it to come out. Right, but it sounds to me like it hasn't com- been completely dismissed. Otherwise, he would never mention it. He would never be so so specific with it. So you, I don't you're know. saying that that. Everything that Paul does is calculated. <laughs> Are you going to put me in a corner to say that? I think everything most celebrities do is calculated. I don't think there's there's a celebrity around today that doesn't do something that isn't mostly calculated. It's just too, it's just the way things are. And unfortunately, the media gets caught up in that all too often. Um, but... But you don't think in, in their heart of hearts with Paul and Ringo that they really think that what they released on the Beatles anthology really is the best of the unreleased material and that that what is unreleased isn't really worth putting out and that no, the don't, general don't. public really wouldn't be that interested in it? I don't believe that at all. I think I think they know that there is stuff there that people would want to hear. Okay. Because they have given those answers, and you're saying that's just, you know, the pat answer. Uh, Yeah, absolutely, it's the pat answer. I mean, when Ringo said right after the anthology came out that that everything that was worth coming out came out on the anthology, and everybody who had the bootlegs of the uh, unsurpassed masters kind of, you know, laughed, and they said, no, you're absolutely wrong. And that, for example, that take of Revolution that came out a couple of years ago, that Mm-hmm. Nobody had heard. Right. I mean, that's that's an excellent example right there. But you're confusing the issue here. <laughs> I'm not saying whether or not there is unreleased material or worthy unreleased material. I'm just saying in their minds, in Paul and Ringo's minds, they may be thinking that there isn't a strong enough interest in that and that maybe it's not worthy of coming out. Well, not Paul, whether or not it, it exists. That's not even the question. Paul, Indi- Paul basically said the other night he knows there's a, there's a strong interest, and the fact that he even mentioned Carnival of Light because it gets mentioned so often is an indication to me that he knows the market is there. He knows the market is there. Okay, so well, I, 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 I right. don't think I don't know if Ringo does, but I think Paul <laughs> does, and I think Yoko does because Yoko put out all that, for example, all that Lennon stuff. So as far as the solo stuff goes. They knew there there was a market. They, uh, Olivia knew there was a market for George George stuff, even though there hasn't been that much rare George stuff. You know, the promise of more George stuff to come has also been, you know, put out there that there will be more. Right. I, but I'm only I, talking about Beatles Group right now. Okay, Beatles Group. Uh, you know, I I think both Paul and Ringo know that there is good stuff in the in the vault and. Whether they put it out is obviously up to them, but they know that there's good stuff. They okay. Know. Well, very quickly, because we have to wrap things up. The 15 songs that Paul played on Jimmy Kimmel were... Magical Mystery Tour, Save Us, Junior's Farm, Jet, New, Lady Madonna, Birthday, Another Day, Everybody Out There, Obla Dee, Obla Da, Band on the Run, Back in the USSR, Day Tripper, Let It Be, and Hey Jude. Okay. And I think the band really sounded uh, very good. I don't think that well, towards the end, I think Paul's voice was, was getting weaker, especially on Hey Jude. But there are just select moments 
mm-hmm. that I'm picturing in my mind there. I will say one thing, and <laughs> you watch the show, Jimmy Kimmel, and you know what impressed me a lot was the house band. Because they were playing McCartney music, and they weren't the typical McCartney songs. Did you, going into did you catch orchestra theme? Not only did they play orchestra theme, they played temporary secretary. <laughs> and they also played coming up, which, you know, number one hit, nothing obscure there. But, right. I mean, not the typical stuff. They didn't play Beatles songs. Nope. I was really impressed with that. Yeah. It's like well, they, in, it, I mean, orchestra theme is one of those songs that doesn't get enough credit, but that's a great song. It's a great instrumental. Mm-hmm. And every now and then, I know in the case of uh, on David Letterman's show, Paul Schaefer, who's a you know, huge Beatle fan, every now and then there'll be a song that they'll play, which is a, a lesser known song. I've heard them play John's song, What You Got, mm-hmm. going into a commercial break. And you either know the song or you don't. And the only people who would know it are the people that have followed you know, all this, the, the solo music of, uh, of the Beatles and of John. Right. But I think it's really cool <laughs> when these bands know something that's not the typical song that you expect to hear. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, overall, uh, the Jimmy Kimmel show, the TV broadcast was a disappointment for me. I liked the interview. It was good, lighthearted, fun. I wish there wasn't so much talk about the Beatles. I wish there was more of an overview of his career. I love when Jimmy Fallon interviewed him because she knew this was a guy that, was very familiar with Paul's solo work. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel asked a lot of Beatle questions, and it's always great to hear the Beatle questions, and I think Paul really likes the light entertainment. He's very good at coming up with funny lines and good stories, and for those 10 minutes, whatever, he's great for an interview like that. I wish there I... was something a little bit, you know, not just talking about the Beatles, because I get really fed up, and this is just a common thing, Whenever Paul or Ringo are interviewed now, you ever see, if you ever see them on television, they talk about, or they're, they're asked questions about the Beatles and the new album. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's 43 years in between there. Ask a few things about what happened in between so that you don't get the impression that he was just a Beatle and he has a new album. Well, I, I, again, I have to, I like the interview a little more, I think, than you did, but I think Kimmel did, did a, a relatively good job uh, making Paul sound good, and yes, he did. I'll give him credit for that, and I like his sense of humor. I always and it was liked, a great. It was yeah. a great conversation, uh, as opposed to, and I keep thinking back to that dreadful Larry King interview that was the most well, embarrassing thing that they ever had to go through. Um, that was the bottom. You know, that was the wor- the worst as far as I'm concerned. And uh, but there I, have been times. You know, this is just going back to this other point that we brought up. Mm-hmm. If you watch the late night talk shows, I remember when Ringo was on Craig Ferguson a couple of years ago, and the entire show was devoted to Ringo. He was interviewed. He had his band there. You know, it, no other guests. That's showing respect for someone that deserves it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul was on David Letterman, got the same treatment, and, and played on top of the marquee. Very similar to this experience with... Jimmy Kimmel and, and the performance on Sunset Boulevard. Right. It's and very that was, much that like that. A, uh, you know, that was a, an incident that compares to this one. That was the first thing I thought of when, when they ended up, when they announced that he was going to be playing outside on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, Paul didn't play in the street in New York. He played on a building. Right. Uh, and this was a little different. But, uh, I mean, it, it, you could probably say that that this one kind of outdid the Letterman thing a little bit. But still, Letterman Letterman did it first. So Yeah, I think the Letterman performance was great. Yeah. I think was, Paul and the really band was. were fantastic was, uh, on Letterman. That was fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and uh, that was, yeah, that was uh, amazing. That was pretty amazing. Yeah, but, um, you know, overall, you got Paul McCartney on your show. <laughs> Most of the time on that show, you should either uh, have an interview with Paul or have him and the band playing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's only right, you know. There are only a few people in this world that are of that status in the music industry. And as much as I like Patrick Dempsey, <laughs> you don't put him on there, you know, towards the end of the show when everybody's waiting for Paul, and you only have two songs of the fifteen in the TV broadcast. We should point out at least. Well, I don't know if by the time this gets posted, if you want to see the full fifteen songs, it's on the MySpace dot com. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel site. It's on, it was on YouTube as of this morning. So it's somebody, ha- not Kimmel, but somebody has posted the full set. Okay. Is it is it all continuous or is it one song at a time? 
It's all continuous. Okay. They took it right off the feed, as I, from what I could see. Right. So, it's there. All right, but uh, you know, I'm always pleased whenever Paul is is you know really giving his all to promote you know his latest work. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's good. It's good to see. I'm curious to see if there'll be another. I know he's doing a, a live show in England too, but it's not. I don't think it's going to be on the order of what he did with Kimmel. Be interesting to see what else he does between now and the album release. Right, and it'll be interesting to see with the Billboard charts where this album debuts. Yes. You know, that, you, too, you, that too. You really can't ask for more from Paul McCartney than what he's doing right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Before we close, I just want to make mention of the fact that um, today, or earlier this afternoon, uh, I had the chance to do a phone interview with Julian Lennon. And uh, if any of you would like to hear it, he's talking about his brand new album called Everything Changes. And uh, the interview, by the time that this gets posted, probably all of it will be on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And uh, he was just a pure joy to talk to and very chatty. (laughs) And uh, I just had a lot of fun talking with him, mainly about the new album, a few things about uh, the early part of his career. And uh, if you're interested, again, KenMichaelsRadio.com is my website. All right, so... For the Beatles, things we said today. I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, remembering that Paul McCartney told everybody on Hollywood Boulevard, we'll see you next time.